Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us at our Cannery Road Aid Sweet Thursday Hoop Doodle. Uh, we have an exciting program today. We're going to be exploring the Monterey Peninsula Sand Dune ecosystem with David Showman and Tim Thomas. Um, I first would like to thank our community um, partners, the Western Flyer Foundation, Cannery Row Company, and Cannery Row Foundation, and the Monterey Public Library. And so just a couple housekeeping things before we get going. I ask that everyone please put themselves on mute uh, just to help limit the distractions during the presentation. And then also questions, uh, please feel free to enter your questions into the chat box and we will um, read them out loud at the end. Or if you'd like, uh, please just hold off until the very end and then we'll have some time for question and answering. But thank you all for joining us. And Tim, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Sean, and welcome everyone. And just a reminder, <clears throat> yes, this is actually the uh, Monterey Magical History Tour Day. And so uh, we are taking, the tour is actually taking a little detour to Canary Road Days today. And, and I'm very honored to have my old friend, David Showman on today. And I have to, we were thinking about that today. I, I, and we were talking about a little bit, and I, I first met David um, a long time ago. We both worked at the Monterey Bay Aquarium when it first opened. And, uh, and that, that was uh, a long time ago, now that I think about it. But uh, he always would tell me these great stories about Monterey Bay and the Monterey sand dunes. And so I'm gonna give you a, read you a little, a little history here. So biologist David Shulman has protected shorelines and coastal habitats for nearly 40 years. He has conducted numerous studies of coastal and marine systems, restored coastal dunes, helped protect endangered and threatened species, and coordinated repairs to storm-damaged shorelines. David has consulted with numerous Monterey Bay com area communities. He wrote the Carmel Shoreline Emergency Action Response Plan and was lead author of the Carmel Shoreline Management Plan. So David knows his sand dunes. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to David. David, thanks for coming today. Thanks, Tim. I'm gonna hit share screen. And all right, there we are. Okay, all right. Good. all right, that shows good. I, uh, you know, I had forgotten about writing the, the Carmel Shoreline Emergency Response Plan. And I'm still waiting for the movie to come out, but we'll see. Anyways, when when Tim first contacted me to uh, to talk about dunes um, as part of the Canary Road Days, I. I I couldn't quite figure out a way that I could get it to fit. Um, uh, and I, I remember that in Sweet Thursday, there were passages where the character Doc had spent time in the dunes and, and, and had thoughts about the dunes, but I, it just wasn't enough for me. And, and then I, I was looking at uh, up on my bookshelf and the copy of Between Pacific Tides that uh, Ed Ricketts had written and I think published in 1939. Um, and I remembered that one of the things that was so unique about it, and I know Steve Webster's talked about this a lot, was that um, before Between Pacific Tides had been published, a lot of the, the works and the books about, uh, about nature and natural history and things like that were done in sort of an old fashioned way where the, the, the species were talked about in terms of how they were related to each other. All the sea stars would be in one section and all the crabs in another section and all the worms here and so forth. And, and Ricketts was able to actually weave together great stories about these areas in terms of their habitats and the interactions between the habitats and so forth. Um, Ed Ricketts did not invent the science of ecology. Uh, there were people who had been working on that for many, many decades before he even started. Um, but when he attended, I think University of Chicago, at least one of his professors, um, was somebody who understood this type of interaction. And, um, and Ricketts was not only a, a great um, uh, observer, but he was a wonderful writer. And so uh, this book came out and it had an effect of, on generations of people who were going to study uh, marine biology afterwards. So um, let me talk to you a little bit about uh, the Monterey Bay sand dunes. Let's see, do this and there we go. 
Now, one of the things about, about dunes is that, um, believe it or not, they're actually in the history of our literature and our arts, uh, many things devoted to dunes. So let me just run this by you. Um, first of all, um, this is sort of what people tend to think of when they think of sand dunes, especially if they don't live along the coast. Um, but let's look at, at some of the sand dunes in literature and art. Um, for example, as you can see at the top of the book, they call this a great classic, uh, Frank Herbert's Dune, um, written, I think in the, gosh, when was that? It had to have been in the, in the late 1960s. Um, uh, many of you who like films might have remembered the movie a few years ago, The Martian, <clears throat> complete with scenes of Matt Damon sitting on reddish sand dunes on Mars, <clears throat> although I have it on good authority that he was actually um, not on Mars, but he was sitting in the sand dunes in the country of Jordan, but that's trifling. Um, and then um, I, I hope you all remember the film Lawrence of Arabia, uh, filmed in the early 1960s, uh, which gave so many people the sense that sand dunes uh, had to have camels uh, wa walking and riding over them, um, and that sand dunes had to be uh, things like these inland dunes. Uh, th this is a photo of sand dunes in, uh, in Death Valley. Um, but we're in a different area. We're in the coast, and coastal dunes have some of the same, have some of the similarities of, of inland dunes, but there are some things that are different, like having a nice ocean not far from there. Um, dunes are made, sand dunes are made of sand. No, no big uh, question mark there. Um, and that's important because um, when geologists are talking about sand, um, sand is identified basically by its size. Uh, sand grains are larger than what you, the sediment in mud or in silt. Uh, but they're smaller than what you get in boulders and cobbles and, um, uh, and, and smaller rocks, pebbles, and so forth. And that's important because it means that the sand grains are small enough and light enough that they can be blown by the wind. And it's really the wind that helps form the sand dunes. Um, and so even when we look at, the, at this, uh, this coastal sand dune, you can still the, see the effects of the wind blowing on the sand. And when the wind blows, it blows low over sand like this, just above the surface. And in doing so, it picks up the sand and moves it. And uh, the, this is what helps build the sand dunes. It also uh, can help destroy them too. Um, in our area, there's a wonderful sign. I like to, I have lots of pictures of signs that we won't talk about. Um, but this is a wonderful sign, caution, drifting sand. And um, here we go. This poor person is not walking next to sand dunes in the Arabian desert, but in fact, he's walking along a road, which is Sand Dunes Drive, um, which extends from Seaside to Sand City. Actually, this photo was taken right uh, close to Costco in Sand City. Um, so we have our own blowing sand dunes here. Now, again, um, if you look at an inland dune, let me compare the inland dunes to the, the coastal dunes. Um, the coastal dunes don't look like this, they look like that. Uh, these are dunes um, in a silomar, and um, unlike the, the, the Lawrence of Arabia dunes, uh, these dunes, if they're undisturbed by human activity, uh, can often be covered by uh, wondrous plants, beautiful flowers. Um, grasses, um, bushes that can sometimes get to be three or four feet high. Uh, it's a pretty amazing place. Now, one of the things is that I mentioned where the sand is bare, the wind blows and the sand will blow all over the place. And that makes it hard on plants that are growing there. These plants can be covered by sand. If you were to pour sand on top of the plants in your garden, they'd most likely die very quickly. But the, the plants that live in the coastal dunes have amazing abilities to withstand even being inundated by sand. Um, this is called Artemisia, it's a beach sagewort. And the Artemisia uh, is able to grow even in moving sand. These plants are growing uh, near the front dune where there's a lot more wind activity. And even here, 
where the, I'm gonna see if this works here. There it is, okay. Um, even around here where there's a lot of uh, sand not covered with plants, uh, the plants around there are still able to grow. Um, I showed you a picture earlier of this uh, uh, native dune grass. It's called Lemus, L-E-Y-M-U-S. And uh, when it gets covered by sand, it has several mechanisms to continue growing. One is that under the sand, it sends out rhizomes. Rhizomes were described as a part of a plant that is part root and part shoot. Uh, the roots extend underground where they help anchor the plant and bring in some of the, the few nutrients and the little bit of water that's there. Um, but the shoots then will pop up above the sand level and um, through photosynthesis, enable the plant to keep growing. Well, in some cases they grow so well, this whole area is covered by this same, uh, the same grass. So I took this out in the dunes just north of the Salinas River. Um, but after a while, you'd never know that there was blowing sand out here. Now, I showed you this, this uh, image before about the sand or the wind blowing low over the, uh, the sand and blowing the sand. But what I wanna tell you is that um, when the wind uh, runs into some obstacle, like say this tree, um, the wind does an interesting thing. It goes up and over the obstacle. Now I'm, I'm uh, showing it probably in a greater way than it really is, but I wanted to get the idea across. The wind goes up and over obstacles. Um, and that's an important thing. So in the dunes, for example, where you have these poppies growing in the dunes above um, uh, Asilomar Beach, what's happening is that the wind actually is going up and over these plants rather than coming down and taking all the sand away. Even these small plants that are only a few inches above the sand, they're enough to cause the wind to change its course just a little bit so it doesn't disturb the dunes. Um, these, uh, these dune grasses do the same thing. Uh, when you get back behind the front dune, where the wind appears to subside a little bit, it actually goes up over the tops of those plants, you start getting these fairly large bushes. Um, uh, the one on the bottom is called mock heather. Um, there are all sorts of, of, of plants in there, artemisia and so forth. Um, and I just wanna show you a couple of the really interesting plants that grow there. Uh, these beech primroses grow right down on the sand, no soil, no fertilizer. Um, and they don't seem to be disturbed by blowing sand. Um, the California poppy, our state flower, this is a coastal variety of it. And um, they grow in, in, um, uh, in multitude out there. Uh, these are some poppies that are in a very low dune just behind Monastery Beach on the coast just south of uh, Carmel. Um, these are verbenas. This uh, verbenas are related to the plant called lantana that some of you might uh, buy in nurseries. Uh, the yellow ver sand verbena, the pink sand verbena, they form huge masses out there. Again, without soil, without fertilizer, uh, without much water. Um, this plant um, taken out in the dunes by Moss Landing, just near the Salinas River. Uh, the red looks like they're flowers, but they're not. The red parts are actually modified leaves. Um, the, I don't know if you can see it, but these little tiny yellowish things that stick out, these are the flowers. Um, I don't have any idea why they put so much energy into making the leaves near the ends of all the stems red, but they're, they're pretty amazing to look at. Um, Beach Morning Glory uh, grows actually in the low dunes. Um, and then as you get a little back farther from the edge of the ocean, you start to get taller, larger, bushier plants. This is a, a purple beech lupin. Uh, they can get three feet high, four feet high. Uh, big masses of them growing among other plants like mock heather and, and, and more artemisia and so forth. Um, in, again, in, in the swales, which are the low part behind between the first and the second dune, um, there's a nice windbreak there for these plants and they grow very, very well. And look at the plants and imagine now birds that come there, birds that might use these thin branches to sit on, to look around for food uh, maybe to be aware, to be wary of uh, predators. Um, and so the plants that are here 
make a habitat that works well for animals too. And uh, the, this part of the dunes is a great place to see uh, many of the birds that, that many of us know. Um, in the back of the dunes, uh, where these plants get very tall, uh, you can actually see there are spaces underneath the plants. And these spaces provide uh, habitat and security for a lot of animals. Um, underneath these plants, um, and again, this is beach sagewort, but underneath a lot of these plants, um, there are places where uh, small mammals live, uh, uh, small uh, field mice live and give birth and raise their young in there and so forth. And even though this is Monterey Bay and it doesn't get very hot here, it is dry out on those dunes. Um, there's very little water. Um, and yet in the summertime, uh, we get a coastal fog and the water droplets from the fog uh, precipitate out onto the leaves and branches of these plants. And then they slowly drip down to the bottom. So any creatures living in there not only have protection from the, from the hot sun in Monterey Bay, but also um, it gets moisture in there. So uh, these plants help create a habitat, not just for other plants, but for animals too. Now in the backs of the dunes are trees. Um, in Asilomar, Pebble Beach, uh, this was taken uh, again in Moss Landing in the back of the dunes. Uh, here's a tree and I just wanna show you this. And that is that um, the wind is coming from the right to the left. And as the wind is going over the top of the dunes, it goes up and over the tree, but over time, the tree will be shaped to conform with how the wind blows here. And over time, and you see this many times in the dunes. For those of you who know the dunes behind Castroville near the Salinas River uh, at Mulligan Hill, uh, at the back of Mulligan Hill, the trees are growing and they perfectly conform to the shape of the hill. Um, same thing here. This is in the Silomar and, um, and you can see my pointer isn't working here. Oh, there it is. And you can see again, the wind comes from the right. And as it goes up, the wind starts drying out the small little stems of the tree. And eventually this tree will be conformed in a shape like this. Um, I love it because it's a process and I like processes. Um, and the same thing for this, this, this tree too. This is a Monterey pine. I think this is in a Silomar. Now, not all of the plants are helpful to the native community here. Uh, this is a succulent that's called ice plant. And um, ice plant, I believe these ice plants originated in South Africa. Uh, some of them were brought in in the early years of the 1900s. Uh, and they were used throughout the early 1900s to help stabilize uh, areas that were exposed to the wind. Um, they grew, not, they were used not only in sand, but also in, in areas with regular dirt. Um, I was reading in Wikipedia and it mentioned that much of the ice plant that was brought into California was brought in during the 1950s and early 60s when Caltrans was building freeways. And they used ice plant, which is a fast growing, very hardy plant uh, to uh, stop the, 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 the dirt in the hills on either side of the freeways from eroding. Um, we have them to thank for this. Um, now ice plant grows very quickly. It's very hardy. Uh, if you were to cut off a stem in the ice plant and put it in water, it grows roots and it can root very quickly. Um, it's so fast that when it grows, it tends to take over. And so if you look at the picture on the lower part of the screen, uh, this is an area of uh, ice plant um, and only ice plant grows in it. Um, it grows so quickly that it tends to outcompete any of the native plants there. Um, it's an amazing plant. Now I'm gonna show you a picture of a plant that doesn't jump out at you immediately. Uh, this is a plant called, um, gosh, I forgot the name of it. Um, it'll come to me, I'm getting of that age where I'm forgetting the plants. Um, uh, this is buckwheat, this is called coast buckwheat. Um, it's a small plant, maybe grows sometimes uh, one or two feet tall. But what, what I find interesting is during the late spring and summer, it has these flowers. And the flowers are pretty amazing just to look at for their beauty. But the flowers also play an important role in the life of another creature. And this is a, an animal. 
This is a, butterf a butterfly called Smith's blue butterfly. Now, what you're looking at is the underside of the wings that's white with uh, black and, and orange spots. But when you look at the back of the wings, they're blue. And this is one of the insects that lives in our coastal dunes that's protected by the Endangered Species Act. Um, and what they do is the, the animals, the insects, will lay their eggs on the buckwheat. And then when the eggs hatch into larvae, the larvae feed on the buckwheat plants and they feed on the flowers. Um, so the life of this endangered, very rare butterfly is tied to these buckwheat plants. If something happens to the buckwheat plants, the butterfly can't survive. Well, what could possibly happen to buckwheat plants? Well, in a lot of the areas where they grow, there's ice plant. And sometimes the ice plant grows so quickly that it outcompetes the buckwheat and the buckwheat disappears. Uh, so buckwheat is one of the several um, uh, introduced species that is able to grow so well that they outcompete a lot of the native species. And you'll find in many parts of the coast, there are movements to replace the introduced aggressive species with more native plants. Now, again, if you look out at this area of the, the ice plant, what you'll notice is how similar it is most of the plants there are anywhere from four to six inches high. Um, the area has pretty much only ice plant in there. Um, other plants don't and can't live there. Underneath the ice plant, there might be gophers and a few other small mammals and rodents that live under there. But biologists and botanists who've gone into big stands of ice plant and who do surveys of what lives in it and underneath it um, have reported continuously that there are so few creatures that live in and around the ice plant compared to the native areas that I've shown you before. So the choice is ice plant or this. You can see which one would be the, the better environment for, for the myriad creatures that live out in our dunes. Now I mentioned um, the butterfly as an animal. Uh, there are animals that live in the dunes. Um, I have to admit to you that um, I'm a lot worse at getting pictures of animals in the dunes than I am of getting flowers. The flowers just stay in one place and they're easy to photograph, but those animals are just, they're always moving all over the place. So sometimes for me, what I see is evidence that animals were in there, like some creature crawling across the sand, dragging its tail. Uh, in the upper picture on the upper left, it looks like somebody had crab for lunch. Um, the crab most likely didn't crawl into the dunes it was probably captured along the shoreline somewhere. And then um, uh, whoever was eating it uh, just happened to drop the, the parts of the crab legs um, into the dunes. On the right side up above, looks like it's the leg bone of uh, a creature, possibly a bird. Um, but often I just see the evidence that there are animals that were in there. Um, look at this, these are, are some dunes uh, near Marina and um, and if you look carefully in the center of it, how's that? This was a snake. I, I have it not keyed it out, so I don't know what kind of snake it is, but it was about two and a half feet long. And it looks like it was going into a burrow, a hole, probably to see what's for lunch down there. So sorry about that. Um, lizards, uh, this used to be the Western fence lizard. It's now the, the coast lizard. Um, and now another creature, this is not a worm and this is not a snake. It's actually another lizard. This is the California black legless lizard. It's about four or five inches long and it's actually a lizard. In fact, when they're young, um, I've seen x-rays of these and you can actually see in an x-ray that right about here, right where the pelvis is, there are little stubs that could have been legs and somewhere back here where the shoulder blade is or it's a vestigial. You can actually see, actually maybe it's around here, what could have been um, four legs. But in fact, this creature has evolved um, a wonderful lifestyle without those legs getting in the way. It's actually able to just burrow down into the sand where it eats all sorts of insects. So there are a lot of interesting things out there. Um, oh, what is that? I don't know if you can see it. If you look in the center, 
it's a nest. Um, and whichever bird laid this nest, the, uh, laid these eggs, you can see that the, the, the nest, which is actually just a depression in the sand, um, there are a lot of broken seashells right in there. And I, I'm not sure that that happened randomly. Uh, I'm not sure what the purpose would be. Um, I've talked to a few people who know birds better than I do, and they weren't really sure what kind of bird it was. Some thought that it could have been a protected species called a Western snowy plover. Um, the first time I showed them to my wife, uh, these are the birds that run along the shore and with their little bill, they're, they're digging down in the sand to get small little creatures in there. And uh, she told me they look like the little wind up birds that you used to see when you'd go in, in downtown parks and stuff, those little mechanical birds that people would wind up. But I assured her that these were real birds. Um, on the other hand, uh, this is a kestrel. It's called uh, sometimes called a sparrow hawk and uh, it's in the falcon family. And this was a picture uh, taken on a fence post in Marina, near Marina State Park. And uh, I'm sure that, that these birds eat whatever they want to eat. Um, now, it's not uncommon for people to see pelicans uh, near the ocean. Uh, often, uh, you can look out uh, over the water and there are pelicans flying over the water and sometimes diving in the water to catch fish. Um, but one of the best places that I like to look for pelicans is here. These are the dunes between Sand City and Fort Ord. And, um, and if you look at this edge right here, the pelicans often will fly along the face of the dunes right along here. Now, sometimes when they fly, they have something else flying with them. Um, not a bird, but somebody who's hoping to be a bird. Uh, these are hang gliders. And the reason why you find hang gliders and pelicans in this area has to do with the shape of the dune here. The first thing I want to tell you is that this shape, this forward edge of the, of the dune is not natural. Um, usually dunes start behind beaches and then slowly rise up and then gently get up to whatever height they're going to do and then come down a little bit. But this very sharp cutoff on the face of the dune is called an erosion scarp. The word scarp comes from escarpment, and uh, which is a very steep and sudden drop. In this case, uh, these are the dunes that go all the way down to the middle of Fort Ord. And in some cases, this thing is over 150 feet high. Well, oh, and there it goes. All right. Now, what happens is when the wind blows up against, when the wind comes off the ocean and blows up against the dune, it comes low over the sand, over the water. And then when it reaches this steep edge, it goes up. And that gives lift to pelicans and to hang gliders. And there are other birds that sometimes you'll see if you go out to the marina dunes or if you go to Sand City and you're looking toward Fort Ord, it's not uncommon to see birds flying along the face of the dunes and rarely flapping their wings. Come to think of it, when I've seen the hang glider fly over there, they don't flap their wings either, but um, these birds know where the uplift is and they fly over it. It's just an amazing thing. Now, when you look at this picture, you're able to see a lot of things all at once. The relationship between the ocean, the sand beach, and the dunes. So let me talk to you a little bit more about sand and beaches and dunes. Um, this is a, a, a satellite picture of Monterey Bay. When I first stumbled onto the Monterey area in 1969, and when I started out the Marine Lab at Moss Landing, I was stunned by the, how beautifully symmetric the, the, the bay is. Um, at the south end of the bay is the Monterey Peninsula, which is where the Santa Lucia Mountains come to the northern end and then they go down into the ocean. Um, I don't have a name for it, but at the top end is where the Santa Cruz Mountains uh, come down to the ocean. And then everything inside of this is, for the most part, sand. Um, and so I want to talk about the southern Monterey Bay area. And uh, it's essentially a beach all the way from Moss Landing south to Monterey. If you were fast enough and brave enough, there are some days during the year that you could walk the 17 miles from Moss Landing to Monterey uh, during a low tide 
and not get your feet wet. Uh, let me just show you some pictures of some of the beaches that you might be familiar with. Salinas River State Beach, uh, just south of Moss Landing, uh, Marina Beach, Sand City Beach. Oh, what is this? Uh oh, Venice Beach. Sorry, this was just here to make you um, be glad that you live in the Monterey Bay area. Um, we'll go back to our beaches, Del Monte Beach. Then, as you get around um, uh, the Monterey Peninsula, you get to Asilomar Beach, Carmel Beach, and then Carmel River Beach. Now, I went through those pretty quickly on purpose because what I'd like to do is show you those again and ask you to look specifically at the sand and look at the color of the sand. Salinas River State Beach, the sand is a very, very light, light tan. And you can see some areas that are almost yellow or orange in there. Uh, Marina Beach, another light tan beach. Um, but when you come down here, uh, there's a sort of a darker brown here, but that's just where the waves come up and make this sort of uh, uh, dark brown color come out. Once this dries, it'll be the same color as the rest of the beach. But then you get to Sand City Beach, um, where even though the water comes in and makes some of the sand look tan, uh, there are darker uh, sand grains in there too. And then Del Monte, I don't even know how to describe that color. But then when you get around the Monterey Peninsula, you get to a Silomar. Look at the color, I'm gonna go back from Del Monte Beach to Asilomar Beach. And uh, Asilomar Beach is, is quite white in color. And then when you get to Carmel Beach, it's very white. And then the last beach in this grouping is Carmel River Beach. And look how different it is. Now, the reasons why the beaches have different colors explain something about how beaches are made. Um, what I wanted to do to show you this was I was able to pull a satellite photo of this area off of Google Maps. And um, you can almost see the difference in color between the upper and the lower beaches. The upper beach is Carmel Beach. The lower beach is Carmel River Beach. Um, and so let's look at Carmel Beach for a sec. When you get to Carmel Beach, what you notice is how white the sand is. If you were to reach down and pick up some sand, um, it's amazingly white. Uh, it's not the whitest beach on the planet, um, but it's certainly uh, one of the whitest beaches uh, in the Central California area. Um, and if you were to take some of that and look at it closely, like take it home and look at it under the microscope, um, what you see is that many of the sand grains are made of quartz and something called feldspar down here and down there. And these are the main components of granite. And that's not, um, um, shouldn't be a, a surprise because this sand was made when waves crash up against the granite rocks that make up much of the Monterey Peninsula. Um, and as the waves are crashing all the time, day and night, 365 days a year, the granite, which we think of as so hard and so strong, starts to break down. Pieces are torn off. And when they fall down, they crash into other pieces of granite. And over time, what were small chunks of granite become smaller and smaller and smaller pieces of granite. And these small pieces eventually wash up on the beach um, and they make white sand. So this is essentially what's, what happens when natural forces crush uh, our local granite here, which is called granite diorite. Um, now that's Carmel Beach. Let's go to the beach south of it. This is Carmel River Beach. And I just want to tell you that if you were walking from the south end of Carmel Beach to the north end of Carmel River Beach, the distance is less than a half mile. And that look at the difference in sand between Carmel Beach sand and Carmel River sand. Now, I wish I could tell you that the Carmel River sand is made when waves crash against the granite rocks. Uh, but this is what it looks like. This is what it look, looks like close up. And again, there's a lot of quartz in here. There's feldspar in there, but there are other minerals too. So where does it come from? Well, it doesn't come from here. It comes from there. 
the material that makes up the sand on Carmel River Beach is material that was eroded from the hills and mountains around Carmel Valley. Now, this is part of the San Lucia Range. Here it is too. And over time, through wind and rain and storm and so forth, um, minerals that were part of the mountain range get washed down into Carmel Valley and they are, um, they are washed into the Carmel River and brought down to the, to the ocean. Um, I read that Carmel River, I think is about 30 miles long, 31 miles long. And so uh, that's a long distance to gather a lot of material to bring to the beach. Um, I, when I was reading Cannery Row, Steinbeck has a wonderful quote. Uh, the Carmel is a lovely little river. It isn't very long, but in its course, it has everything that a river should have. So good for Steinbeck. Uh, so this is Carmel River Beach and all of that sand in there is made up more of what comes down from Carmel Valley and apparently very little of the white sand makes it around Carmel Point. Let's go a little bit south. Um, south of uh, uh, Carmel Valley is uh, Point Lobos, um, a beautiful state reserve. Uh, there is a beach on Point Lobos, Gibson Beach, um, which has white sand. And as you can see up here, uh, much of the coastline around Point Lobos is right up around here. So the same thing that forms the white sand there forms the sand at, at um, Gibson Beach at, at Point Lobos. But if you go to the beach by Sea Lion Cove, the beach doesn't have sand, it has gravel, small pieces, small rocks, and these are volcanic. And apparently they're left over from volcanic activity that happened along a, a big swath of California millions of years ago during the Cretaceous period. If we go south of there, we go to Big Sur and one of my favorite beaches is Pfeiffer Beach. And if you just look north from this point, uh, it looks like many of the beaches along the central California coast. But if you look in the opposite direction, if you have a better camera than I have, and if you're a professional photographer who got there just in the right time, this is what he saw. This purple stuff is not pollution. This purple stuff is sand. And this sand is actually made of a material called garnet. If any of you do work with sandpaper, uh, you might have seen garnet sandpaper. Garnet is an incredibly hard mineral. And in several places in the Santa Lucia Mountains, there are outcrops of garnet. And along with everything else that erodes up there, when the garnet erodes, it comes down the creeks and the streams, comes out to the shoreline where it's deposited, where there are these large blotches and streaks of beautiful purple color. Again, when you look at it closely, you can see the purple mixed in with the granite or with the uh, quartz. And when you look at it under the microscope, um, the purple stuff is garnet. The black minerals are um, a material called mag magnetite, I think it's called. And it's a material that has a lot of iron in it. And if you were to uh, put a magnet through that sand, all the black stuff would jump up, join the magnet. And then the, um, let's say you were the kind of person who had a bottle of this stuff you could make the bottle much more purple because the black stuff comes out with the magnet. Sadly, um, I don't know of any beaches in California that have sand dunes made of purple sand, but I'm still looking. Um, but it's just absolutely beautiful stuff. Well, what I've been showing you happens not just on the coast, but it happens all over. Uh, this is a, a, a beautiful photo topo map of, of uh, California, uh, the 800 mile or so uh, shoreline, Monterey Bay, San Francisco Bay, the Great Central Valley. And then east of that is the great mountain range called the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Uh, these mountains are made up of mostly of granite. Uh, this is Mount, Mount Whitney. And even though these are great strong granitic mountains, um, they're also subject to erosion. And the same thing, the wind, the rain, the snow, the ice, eventually start breaking things down Big rocks fall, break into smaller pieces, smaller pieces rub up against each other and become smaller. Some of them come over waterfalls. I just took every picture of Yosemite I could think of. Um, and then as these things crash down, the pieces get smaller and smaller and smaller. And they get to be so small that they get to be moved in rivers. 
Now, this is not a California river, but I like the picture when I saw it online because it shows the brown water. And think about most of us don't like to see brown water, but the brown in the water might be some mud, might be some silt, but it might also be sediment that could be carrying sand, which would help protect beaches. In Monterey Bay, we don't have any big rivers like that, but the river we do have is the Salinas River. And the Salinas River goes for 175 miles, believe it or not, when you add up all the tributaries and so forth. And when it comes up to the shoreline, especially during the winter time, oh, I'm sorry. And as it comes to the shoreline, it's bringing sediment that eroded from the hills and mountains that surround our Salinas Valley. Um, these are the, Santa, the foothills of the Santa Lucias. These are the Gabalons on the east side. And if it comes during the winter or early spring, uh, the river just plunges straight out into the ocean. And you can see by looking at the water that there's a lot of material here. And some of this again is silt and mud, but some of it is also sand. And I'll tell you about that a little bit later. Now, when the Salinas River discharges its sand to the ocean, one of the things it does is it moves some of the sand northward, and that's very uncommon. Um, when you study rivers and, and, and shoreline transport of sand, you find that in North America, in most places, most of the time, the sand goes to the south, but there are a combination of, of conditions that enable sand coming out of the Salinas River mouth to go north just for about five miles, all the way up to Moss Landing. Uh, and that's very handy for the people who live and work in Moss Landing, um, all the way down to near the Salinas River. Oh, we'll get to that in a little bit. Much of the sand though, or almost all of it goes to the south. And if though, if you go to the river during the summertime, there's a lot less water in the Salinas River at the surface in the summer than during the winter. And in fact, a combination of the low water level and uh, a sandbar, I'm pointing with my finger, a sandbar that builds up blocks the river from going into the ocean. And so there are times during the summer when I mentioned you can walk all the way from Moss Landing down to Monterey, uh, you need to make sure that the Salinas River is closed off and you can actually walk right past the river mouth. Now, there are a few times when the Salinas River's mouth changes a little bit in this case, and this was in February of 1983 during the El Nino period when the river mouth, instead of breaking straight out opposite the river, it curved north and it went up about a half a mile. Um, I was there then and um, I thought it was pretty fascinating, but the people who lived in these houses didn't think it was so fascinating. Um, these houses were part of, I think, 120 townhouses that were built in the mid seventies, uh, just north of the Salinas River. And I know that especially when the river was getting just to here and had not made that turn. When it was closed off, it was coming to here and here and here. It was still going close to the houses. They were very concerned about this. Uh, you want to have a good river view, but not out your front door. Um, and these are the houses. And again, I'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, so the Salinas River brings uh, some sand to the north, but a lot to the south. And as it comes down, uh, to the south, especially during the late spring and summer, um, the, the waves during the summertime especially are, 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 are not very powerful. They come in very slowly and they wash sand up from the beach or uh, from underwater up onto the beach. And then when at low tide, when the tide goes out, the sand gets dry and if it's windy, then that sand gets blown up to form sand dunes. So the sand dunes have their start with sand that usually comes from often many miles away. So let's look at our, our, our regular coastal dune here. Look at the difference, a pretty amazing thing. There are areas in our dunes that look like this picture, but areas that tend to be undisturbed by human activity, there are areas like this that are just gorgeous. Now there are, creatures and people who love to live in uh, close to the shoreline. And among them are the people who live down here, for example. Um, 
This is a hotel that was built, I think, in the 1960s. When I got here, it was a Holiday Inn. Uh, over time, it became the Monterey Beach Hotel. Now it's called the Monterey Tides. Um, I think it shows a direction they're moving in. Um, and in order to protect this, oh, and one other thing before I tell you that is, you can see that their beach actually has an area that comes in closer here than out there. It's not just the curvature of the, of the coast. It has to do with the fact that in order to protect their building from these things, they built seawall. And the seawall goes around the, the north side, the west side, and the south side, closes it off in three ways. And they built it to protect the, the, the buildings um, from shoreline erosion. What happens though, is that when the waves crash up against a solid wall, sometimes the energy of those waves goes straight down and digs out sand from in front of the wall, or sometimes it goes around either side and will start to erode on this side here or start to erode on this side down here. Um, this is a photo taken um, by some uh, oceanographers at the Naval Postgraduate School using LIDAR. And uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, the hotel. And you can see again how the area that's not protected by the, the seawall has made this almost a peninsula. And eventually the water is likely to come in here and in here. I'm sorry about that. Um, farther south uh, is a set, uh, an area that used to be apartments, the ocean house apartments, but now they're condos. And uh, the same thing, when this was built, it was uh, farther back from the ocean than it is now. And I'll give you a hint, at night when nobody was looking, the building didn't creep closer to the ocean. But over the years, the ocean has gotten closer to the building. And so what they did is they have poured rocks in front between the building and the water. Uh, the rocks are less expensive than, um, than a seawall, but there are questions about the impact of the rocks on the shoreline also. And I'll just show you, if you live there, when you want to go down to the beach, that's what's between you and the beach. Um, this is a building that um, I don't think you, can, you can't see anymore. Uh, during the Second World War, the first part of the Second World War in the early 1940s, um, the army under the direction of General Stilwell built a soldiers club for the enlisted soldiers. I think it was one of the first army bases that actually had a, um, a, a huge hall for the enlisted, off, uh, the enlisted soldiers. Um, now, uh, when I got here, it was referred to as Stilwell Hall. Um, when it was built, it was farther back from the ocean. I don't know how far back. I've been looking for that information and I still can't get it. But again, nature did what it normally does. And if you can look at it now, this is a photo taken in 2002. And you can see that the building and even part of the parking area in the road are actually hanging over the edge. Uh, by this time, Fort Order had closed and Monterey Bay was a national marine sanctuary. So the Corps of Engineers came in, I think around 2003, 2004, and they dismantled, oh, there it is, 2002. And then they came and they dismantled the building. Uh, this is an aerial photo taken in 2005. Um, and again, look at the shape of this scarp here. This is one of those erosion scarps. So um, this was caused by the erosion of these high, high dunes. And then up the road a little bit, um, which is north of the Salinas River, um, are these dunes houses. I think 120 of these townhouses the folks who live there though, got a pretty good understanding of the dunes. And so one of the things they did was they did things to try to protect the dunes. They put in boardwalks. Um, they didn't do much growing of new dune plants because once they put the boardwalks in and they had rules that home property owners and visitors couldn't walk on the dunes unless they're in, in, uh, on boardwalks, the dunes started growing back and the dunes are in incredible shape. But even though the dunes are in good shape, um, the area is still eroding and the folks are still dealing with uh, shoreline uh, getting closer and closer uh, to the ocean. Um, and there are many things that cause it. And I'm just gonna give you a quick list and then I'll be able to, to break off in, in just a few minutes. Um, there are challenges to sand dunes. Um, there are natural challenges and I've talked about most of these. There's salt. Um, 
When the waves crash, there's salt spray on the leaves of many of the plants, but these plants are adapted to survive that. Um, the wind, uh, not only the wind constantly blowing on the plants, but also the wind blowing sand that can inundate the plants and the plants that, that especially the ones that live in the fore dune, the part of the dune closest to the ocean can survive and, and in fact thrive in that condition. There's not much fresh water there. Um, and yet these plants still continue to thrive. Uh, th there's no soil, it's basically salt. I'm sorry, it's basically sand. I defy any of you to go home and take any of the plants out of the pots in your backyard or on your porch and put them in sand and see how well they survive. But these plants can survive these amazing natural challenges and the sand. Um, the, the amount of sand on the beach changes naturally. And that's something these plants have to be able to survive. And I showed you uh, the pictures of those uh, dune grasses that can send out those rhizomes underneath and then pop up somewhere else. And eventually they've built a whole network of these plants. <coughs> Excuse me. Now there are human caused challenges. The sand supply chain, about a week ago, I was going for a walk, taking our pup for a walk, listening to NPR and they talked about supply chain disruptions. And I thought, wait, that happens in the dunes. And that is that there are things that interrupt the flow of sand that might go from the mountains down to in front of somewhere on your shoreline. Um, there are dams and reservoirs that are built on rivers. Now, a recent study looking at the dams and reservoirs that were along the Salinas River and its, um, uh, and its uh, tributaries shows that the Salinas River doesn't contribute as much sand to the Southern Monterey Bay as it used to be thought. Um, but there are many other areas where there are coastal beaches and dunes um, where they're dependent on um, the sand that they're dependent on is held up inside of a dam. When you dam up the water, it forms a big lake. The sediment starts to settle down onto the bottom. And, um, and so the rivers carry less sediment, which means your beaches are less protected. Sometimes they'll drain part of the, the, the dam and then try to dig out the sand. And then they just get rid of it commercially rather than putting it back in the river so it can uh, come down to the, to the ocean. Um, there are jetties and groins. These are artificial structures that are built along the shoreline, sometimes to protect the entrance to harbors. Um, sand often will build up on one side of them and not the other side. Um, I remember years ago when they built the, um, the Santa Cruz uh, uh, Yacht Harbor, and in order to uh, make the conditions good and calm for the sailboats to get into the Yacht Harbor, um, they put uh, jetties on both sides of the entrance. Um, well, it turned out that sand started building up on the north end of that. And uh, the very next summer, um, the city of, uh, uh oh, quick, what's the name of the beach? Greg, what's the name of the beach south of uh, Santa Cruz? Sea Cliff. See, no, farther south. It's a beach town. You know, Del Mar, Cap I don't know how far you want to go. Capitola? Capitola, that was it. In it was Capitola. Capitola. Thank you. And they didn't get their beach and they ended up suing the Harbor District. And, and until the Corps of Engineers put a, a pump in there, um, the, the town lost its beach during the, uh, the winter time and it never came back. Where was the sand? It was on uh, build up on one side of the jetty. So these things interfere with the, 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 the sand uh, supply chain and sand mines. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with sand mines, but sand is a very important um, commercial product and, um, and north of uh, actually in four or five different places, there have been sand mines that were here, certainly when I got here in the, in the late 1960s. Um, there was one north of, uh, of the city of Marina, which was called the Semex sand mine plant. There was a sand mine in, um, in San City, good place to put it. Uh, sand mine in, I think, uh, Seaside. Um, there was one, and then there was one near Silomar where they took out that white sand. Um, over time, all of these things have finally been taken down. The Semex sand mine north of Marina was taken down a few years ago, thanks mostly in part to a, an oceanographer at the Naval Postgraduate School, Dr. Ed Thornton. Um, but um, this sand that was being taken out and it's used commercially, if you mix it with cement, it's one of the things that can help turn cement into concrete. 
it's used commercially. If any of you are interested in this, there's a film out, a documentary called Sand Wars, and you might want to look at that. It's pretty interesting. Um, but this was all sand being taken from the shoreline um, and moved away in trucks and railroad trains rather than to go on to the, the, the longshore transport and be moved up and down the coast. Um, and then erosion. And uh, I just want to mention that in some cases, erosion is natural, and in some cases, humans will, uh, will contribute to it. Um, when they put up armoring like seawalls and, and the, the rock walls, uh, they have been found to increase the rate of erosion. Um, and then there's trampling. Uh, those beautiful dunes that I showed you, uh, in areas where people are allowed to walk and run freely, they trample the plants. The plants can take so many harsh conditions, but they can't be trampled on. And over time, once the plants die, then the winds blow, and now there's nothing to hold the sand down, and the dunes are blown away. Um, development. And then the last thing I'll mention is climate change. Um, I have a lot more to tell you about, uh, but Tim asked me not to talk for four days. Um, so what I would recommend to you is, if you do get a chance, especially during the spring, um, find some beautiful dunes and, and walk over there. You don't have to trample the dunes to see them. There are places where dunes have um, uh, uh, boardwalks to walk on. Uh, Asilomar is a, is a wonderful place and uh, they've done a great job of resurrecting the dunes there, but it's an interesting system. And I was thinking about when I was a kid in English class and they, they told me that nouns were a person, place or thing. And those are things, but I now look at things as processes. And I think that it's time that we start to appreciate the fact that what we call a place like the beach or a thing that we call the dune is actually a process that changes on small scale, big scale, changes quickly, changes slowly. But I think when we start looking at things as processes, we'll have a better sense of how to better manage them too. So um, Tim, uh, I think I'm finished. So tell me what I need to do. Let's see. I'm gonna thank you, Dana. Stop. That was a really excellent talk. I really I learned a lot from that today. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. So we open it up to the audience. If anybody has any questions, um, now is the time. John, can you pick up those ones from the chat? Yes. So we have one question that came in. Can you comment on the closure of the Simex? Plant and likely effect on beach erosion <clears throat> erosion in Monterey Bay? Um, the Samex plant was a plant that was taking water actually from the surf zone. Uh, and it, it, what it did is it built a lagoon farther up and or built a, an artificial lagoon. And when sand would get in there, they actually had um, a barges in there mining the sand. And I, I don't know the amount of sand that was taken because they never really reported to the government about it. Um, and, um, but it was a vast amount. Uh, Ed Thornton from the postgraduate school and, and several other colleagues um, wrote a paper a few years ago about erosion of the Southern Monterey Bay area. And they said that much of it was actually due more to the sand mining, including the Semex plant, than it was to, uh, uh, to just ocean waves and, and natural causes. Um, it, it, they finally were pushed to close um, and they closed, I think, a few years ago. And uh, I recently read a study that said that uh, the amount of sand moving south uh, from Marina is actually more than it had been in several years. So I think they're open. I think what they can do now is they're only able to use the sand that they've already taken out of the system. So when you drive past that plant, you can see still some hills of sand. And again, apparently it's a, a great economic commodity. So the idea is now that the sand mines have closed, um, that there's a big hope that it will increase the amount of sand uh, moving along the shore. Thank you. Uh, we have one comment. Um, they were hoping this talk would include a review of the new movie, Dune. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so a couple questions coming in um, and Greg, I see you with a question. Uh, question, what lives in the sand and does plowing at the Carmel, Carmel River State Beach yearly cause harm? 
Wow, that's a good question. Um, there are many insects that live in the sand. Uh, there are some uh, uh, marine creatures that, that burrow underneath the sand too. When you are watching uh, birds walking along the shore and the birds are pecking down into the sand, they're looking for small creatures, small in marine invertebrates and, and small insects that are in there. Um, that mostly is done on the beach and not up in the, the dunes itself. There are a few things that live up in the dunes that burrow underneath it. Um, and the city of Carmel does a lot of uh, 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 bulldozing. Uh, at the end of a summer of uh, people coming to the Carmel beach, a lot of the sand that used to be up on the hills has now been forced down toward the beach uh, just by uh, feet walking up and down the hill. And so what they do is they do a sand redistribution to move the sand back up the hill um, and I don't think there have ever been any studies of any um, uh, creatures that might be affected by that. And the same for the Carmel River uh, Beach. I will, I will check on that, and, but um, I don't think anybody's really done a good study. And I think it should be done. Um, and you know that uh, the Carmel River mouth uh, often has to be opened by bulldozer uh, in order to make sure that the Carmel River flows during the wintertime uh, so there won't be flooding. They're not always successful in doing this, um, but they do have a permit, I think from the Corps of Engineers to do bulldozing there. And I, I will double check and see whether anybody's ever had a look at what the impact of this is. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, next question. What is the status of the buckwheat today at the sand dunes? Well, at the sand dunes covers a, a huge area. Uh, some parts like by the Carmel River mouth, the area, be, I'm sorry, the uh, Salinas River mouth, uh, much of the area between Salinas River mouth and Moss Landing and south uh, to where the Semex plant were, are in very good shape and they're, they're, they're quite healthy. Um, and there are groups that are collecting seeds of buckwheats and planting them in different places, but the buckwheat can't just live by itself. It needs um, a dune that is fairly well stabilized, which means it has to have a healthy plant community. I also see the buckwheat plant out in the Asilomar dunes too. Um, and there are groups, there are uh, Lepidopterists who are coming down and, and looking at the Smith's blue butterfly as well as the monarch butterflies up in the trees. Thank you. Um, next question, has anyone published any studies of the sand and the dunes at the end of the Salinas River as a result of the San Clemente Dam removal? No, and I think, I'm not sure of this, but isn't the San Clemente Dam on the Carmel River? Yes. I think it is. Um, okay. And they recently removed that dam. I think apparently it wasn't earthquake safe. And, uh, and as you know, one of, the, one of the benefits of removing the, the, the dam is the water flows faster, there's more water there, and that helps um, uh, steelhead uh, and other important fish. But again, I don't think, I don't know of any studies about the, uh, I'm sure that there are studies going on for that. I have to plead ignorance on that. Sorry. All right, next question. Um, what is the Little Sur River Beach like? It should be the offspring of the Pico Blanco? Yes, I think, yes it is. Uh, you can see the Pico Blanco when you're coming around Highway 1 and going inland a little bit around the Little Sur River. And that's material from, from I think, Pico Blanco and, um, and probably other hills there, but I'll bet Pico Blanco is, uh, contributes to it the most. Thank you. Um, does anyone else would like to ask a question? Um, it's open. Um, you can unmute yourself. Please feel free. Yes. All right. Um, well, thank you so much, David, for that. Thanks, Jerry. I think we have a question down here. Oh, cool. Yes. I don't have a question, but I thought I would let you know that when you talked about the ice plant coming from South Africa, my South African niece came here and just went so enthusiastic mm -hmm. because the um, ice plant, when it flowers, when it dries, you pick it and it tastes like fig in the middle of it. And oh. so she's got tons and tons of that. And she was surprised that we don't eat that 
here. Mm. I picked a lot of it too, and it's it was quite tasty. Huh. Wait, I I have to tell. Right. Excuse me. Oh, you have just solved the mystery I've had for forty years. Um, <laughs> the, the ice, actually, forty-one years. The ice plant. Um, one of the common names is the sea fig, or it used to be called That's the hot. It. And it used to be called the hot and tot sea fig, but again, they changed that because they thought it was pejorative to the hot and tot people. Um, but one of the common names was sea fig, and I never understood it. It didn't look like a fig to me, um, mm -hmm. but I've, I've never heard of that. And so I will, um, I'm not sure I'll check it out personally. I'll, I'll have my son take a bite of it, see how well he does. But I'd never and heard of that. she called it too. Oh, that's very, well, you know, um, maybe that might make a way of removing the ice plant. And that is if it turned out to be a delicacy, then we could have <laughs> enough people eating it. And then we could replace it um, with native plants that do really well in our habitat. And, uh, and we could make sure that the sea figs back in, in South Africa are growing well and happily. So <laughs> thank you. Good. You know, also in, um... I was working on a project a couple of years ago about La Perouse, the French scientist explorer who was in Monterey in 1786. And they collected a number of things around Monterey Bay, including what we, I think, today call beach rocket. That's uh, a plant. I right, right, that. right. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's called a uh, sea rocket. Sea and, rocket, uh, that is it. Rocket, yeah. And, well, that uh, eventually got back to Paris. Right. And it's, to this day, still grows in the King's Garden in Paris. I, I need to tell you that uh, Sea Rocket, and I don't have any, I didn't show any pictures today yeah. of Sea Rocket, but um, uh, when you go to the Native Plant Society, there's still a debate about whether it's a native plant or a European huh? plant that was brought here. And the fact that it actually might have started out here, made its way back to France, <clears throat> and then came back. Um, that's interesting. I, yeah. I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you this week and I can get more information. Yeah, it, it, I went to Paris and I spent a long time at the King's Garden trying to find it. We weren't able to find it, but I've been told that it does grow there. You know, this is for folks in Greg Kaye and Tom Pelican and the other folks that I, who I've known for a long time. This is such a wonderful thing because you start with something like somebody just coming to talk about sand and it ends up going into biology, physics, business, <laughs> gravity, history, all these things. And it's like so many things that they're connected. And once you start pulling on one string, you find it's attached to everything else in the universe. So, uh, um, oh, thank you. That's all great stuff. I hadn't heard that. Okay. And we have another question that came in. Do you know, are there any organized efforts in ice plant remediation? There are, there are groups that get together and have ice plant pools. Uh, and they do it in many different places. Um, and Greg, I wouldn't be surprised if people from the Marine Lab at Moss Landing do that in, in the, the dunes that were south of the original Marine Lab. There wasn't much ice plant, but from time to time, people would gather together and pull the ice plant out. Um, the old site where the lab used to be before the earthquake has been totally restored to native vegetation. Yep. And yeah, they continue was, to monitor it and pull out the bad guys. Yeah, I like that. Oh, we don't call them bad guys. They're just misled. Uh, many of them were brought here against their will. So uh, we treat them with respect and, and eat them. I never thought about that. Um, <laughs> but uh, there, are, there are groups that occasionally have ice plant pools. Um, when Tom Moss worked for state parks out at Asilomar, um, he was one of the champs of pulling ice plant out there. There is a, another plant there that is harder to get rid of though. And that is uh, pampas grass which has been growing uh, along in many parts of California. Um, sometimes when it gets out in the dunes, and if you know it when it's flowering, those little seeds just blow in the wind and they're really hard to, to stop. So um, it's, it's, I think it's worth putting energy into keeping these things native because they do a good job of protecting us because the diversity of plants help hold the sand down and it's, it's marvelous. Yes, Sherry. One, one last question. Can you tell me a little bit about the dunes right at Del Monte Beach? I remember that they were restored 
a while back, I, I, I want to say 20 years ago, was that the Native Plant Society that did that? It might have been. Actually, I think Bruce Cowan was involved in it. And I think that, again, these, I think part of that might have been done with funding from the postgraduate school. Um, but these are things that need to be continued on over the decades. And uh, uh, it's worth looking into. But the Native Plant Society is certainly a good place to start and just ask around to see if anybody's doing it. Um, there are some nurseries that uh, grow native dune plants. Um, Greg, one of your former students, <clears throat> set up a nursery where uh, she grew native dune plants and, and those were often used in restorations and so forth. Um, so there are people who do this. And, um, and again, if you looked at the pictures that I showed you of these vast areas of native dune plants, they're, they're spectacularly beautiful and they're hardy and they're tough. So, oh. All right. Well, it looks like there's no more questions. Uh, I want to say a special thanks for, to David Shaman and Tim Thomas for a wonder, wonderful yeah. presentation today. Um, and our sweet Thursday hoop doodle does not end this week. Um, we have another great presentation coming up next week, uh, October 28th at 4 p.m. We have natural fluctuations, seashars, sea urchins, kelp, and squid with Greg Kaye, whether it was the real Ed Ricketts at the Pacific Biological Laborator Laboratories or Steinbeck's dock and Cannery Row or Sweet Thursday, one would know that he was constantly observing the marine environment, looking for trends. Greg will explore the cycles, some natural while others human cause that have, occur have occurred over many decades in the Monterey Bay ecosystem. So if that sounds interesting, um, please feel free to register at the Monterey Public Library. And that's next Thursday at four o'clock. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. David, thank you. Tim, thank you. And um, everyone uh, have a great evening. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, thank David. You. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Tim. That was great. Thank you. Oh.